is great to be with you guys this morning. Why don't we start the day off the right way and give our neighbors here a greeting with a nice hug or a handshake. Amen. Everybody online, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. It is great to, to be with you. It is great to just have you join us in this way. And uh, I just want to say, uh, if you want to get in contact, contact with us for whatever reason, if you need a prayer request or anything like that, please go ahead and uh, click on the, the link in, uh, below. And uh, we would just love to hear from you. Uh, drop us your information. And uh, we, would just, we would just love that. And thank you so much for being with us again today. And it is such a blessing. And thank you very much. And uh, stay tuned for the rest of the service. Thank you guys so much. Thank you everybody for being here this morning. It is great to be with you guys. It is, uh, it is wonderful to be here in the house of the Lord. And uh, you know, before we get started, I just wanna go ahead and say a prayer for our worship service. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for being, for being our God, for being our God who loves us, for being our Father who just wraps his arms around us, God, when we need you the most, Lord. And as we give you praise and worship this morning, Lord, we just want to let you know that you are worthy. You are worthy of every last word that we sing, every last prayer of our heart and cry of our heart, God. And we love you, and, uh, oh, and we, just, we just thank you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
thing well, The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting well, The same God who's never late Is working all things out Is working all things out Oh yes I will lift you high morning. Woo. I know I needed that last song. I find myself maybe doing that a little too often where it's like, you know what? You know, it's where I can be sometimes just a little bit selfish as a worship leader. I'm like, I need this song this week and I need God to sing these words into me. And, uh, and that was definitely one of those. With that, um, we are coming to our time of communion. If you uh, are a believer in Christ, we invite you to take communion with us before we uh, practice open communion here. And if you're joining us online too, uh, we would like to uh, give you this moment to grab your elements and join us in communion also. And if you haven't grabbed a cup yet, just go ahead and raise your hands and we have someone in the back that can, that can grab a cup for you. <sighs> so, with... A lot of uh, people in here that I know who are um, a little further along uh, the road of life than I am. I'm sure most of us have, uh, have a lot of kids. And uh, we probably learn more, at least I have as a parent, learn more about grace uh, and the grace that God has for all of us from my role as a dad. And I had, uh, anybody ever have a, a kid that maybe said or used some words or got upset with you as a parent and said some things that, you know, I'm like, I don't know a grown man that would ever say that to me. <laughs> anybody ever have that happen? I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> um, and in those times, I... I the last thing I want to do is have grace in that situation for him because uh, 
my brain tells me, you know what, in this moment, he's getting everything that he deserves. But maybe he doesn't deserve what me as a dad, what my full wrath is. And uh, he never will. And through everything that I've done in, in my life that I know, not only my mom and other people in my family, and, and uh, especially God has given me grace for and has gotten me through, uh, I, can't, I can't help but be overwhelmed by feelings of, of joy knowing that, okay, I got through that and I was able to compose myself as a, as a man of God and as a father to this young man in front of me, knowing that it all just comes from emotions that maybe he can't control yet as a teenager and, and give him the grace as not only my son, but as a child of God that he does deserve. And I just want to share with you a verse which comes from Ephesians in chapter 2, and I know we're all, we're all very familiar with it. And starting with verse, with verse 8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus, Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's by his grace and love that we're going to be in eternity with our Lord and Savior. It's not by the things that we do here. It's because he loves us that much. And that is the reason why we do practice our communion today. To remember his love, to remember his sacrifice for us. It was on that night when Jesus was with his disciples, Jesus took the bread, breaking it, giving thanks, saying, take this and eat, for this is my body given for you. Eat in remembrance of me. And in that same manner, Jesus took the cup, the cup of the new and everlasting covenant, passed it to each one saying, take this and drink for the salvation of many. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for being our Father in heaven who loves us like nothing else. And God, we, we give you our hearts this morning, God. We just open it up to you with whatever, whatever it is you want to tell us for the rest of this service, through our worship, through the word that's coming, God. God, we just want to be open to you, God. And we just want to receive the gifts that you have for us. Amen. time where I would just like to also discuss too at the end of service we have uh, our time of offering I just want to encourage you to give from your heart I always say a penny given from the heart is worth more than a hundred dollars given begrudgingly it'll do more works and that's God's word and I just want to pray for the offering right now God God as we give as we give to the programs that we have not only in this place so that we can run and we can do, do your works and glorify you in this community, God, but for everything that we do as far as our missions and things that we do outside of these walls, God, the people that we're able to help and bless because of the faithfulness of the people in this building, God, we just want to thank you. And we just want to just have you bless every, every single penny that is put in the offering today. God, we love you. We give you praise this morning. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. And the kids are off. Awesome. All right. Well, feel free. Let's go ahead and let's come back to our Lord in our worship service. However you feel comfortable, let's just, let's just sing him our praises and let him know that we love him. Who 
am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Just died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, always free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father. Everything I 
You keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praising, you keep proving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. And I keep looking, I keep finding. You keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying, you keep moving. I keep praising, you keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. Yeah. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground. No matter where I go, I don't need to worry now that I know. Everything I need, you got. There's honey in the rock, a purpose in your plan. Power in the blood, healing in your hands. Started flowing when you said it is done. Jesus, who you are, is enough. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. Trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Oh, how sweet, how sweet it is to trust in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Who here believes that we have a God that satisfies our needs? No matter where we're at, when we're out in the wilderness, when we think that there's nothing out there that can satisfy us, can satisfy our body, can satisfy our soul, our God promises that even, that he will have that substance for us in the wilderness, whether, whether it even be the honey, that sweetness from the, from the stone, our God, will prov- our God will provide for us. And I'm so thankful that we have a God that when we believe in him, when we love him, that he's a God that does that. Amen. Amen. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand. My soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours, Lord. So I stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. My soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. Mm. Before creation, eternity in your hand, you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. What can I do? 
So I 
I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand my soul all to you surrendered all I am is your Amen. Lord, we thank you, God. We give you all praise this morning. Thank you so much for being a God. A God that is always with us. A God that I vow to always stand for. God, you created everything. You've shown us love more than than anything in the galaxy ever could, Lord. Lord, we give you as much as we can. You deserve so much more. It's in your son's name that we pray this morning, God. Amen. You may be seated. Anytime you hear the word cancer, you seem to maybe think of the worst. They had told me that there was a tumor inside my colon, and I had to wait two days before I found out whether or not it was cancer. I had told my group to pray for me, and so they were waiting on those results on that day. After we did find out that it was indeed cancer, I called and told, you know, one person. Our whole group's reaction when we first heard about Jennifer was just, you know, we were shocked that someone our age could be diagnosed with such a serious disease. In my mind, I'm thinking, how am I gonna do this? You know, am I gonna be able to still do my daily responsibilities? How do I keep the house clean? And how do I, you know, cook dinner, you know, and take care of three kids? We, you know, were immediately beginning to think of ways that we could help her family. I didn't really have any expectations. I didn't, you know, think, oh, well, my group will come to my aid. I had no idea the type of response that it would bring. As Jennifer was going to her, her treatments, you know, Monday through Friday, she had to do something with the children and there were people that were there. They showed up and said, we've got your kids for the next hour. We would go out to check the mail and, you know, trip over a huge box of diapers. Or we would go out and have just paper plates and napkins. We probably didn't have to go to the store for weeks. One day I remember coming home and I'm like, what is that noise outside? And there were three guys outside uh, mowing our yard. You know, it's just, it's things like that. People just showed up to help. They sent out an email saying that they were gonna collect money for bracelets if anyone would wanna wear a bracelet that said the Anderson family. The proceeds that we made, we just gave it to Jeff and Jennifer. We had raised uh, close to $1,200. They took my husband and I out to dinner and just presented us with this you know, enormous check. There were families that very generously paid for Jeff and Jennifer's parking at the hospital for a year. Everyone was there and people that hadn't been in the class very long were knocking at the door saying, how can we help? The group just really wrapped their arms around Jeff and Jennifer during this entire process. People wanted to be there to help. I definitely learned a lot about caring for others during this time. Instead of just asking, you know, hey, you know, I want to help you. Let me know if you need anything. I learned just to do it. You know, just, you know, you don't necessarily have to wait for an invitation. It was incredible. <laughs> you know, for the first time in my life, I saw you know what the body of Christ was all about. Words can't even describe how I felt during this because of all that my group had done. This time it was our family and what our family needed. But you know, whenever a group cares for other people, you know, it just it just cements the bond. Well, good morning, church family. It is a true blessing to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Uh, that video is not a video about cancer. That video is a video about God's people coming together 
as a family and taking care of each other. And what do we want you to... The reason I selected that this morning is because we are going to have a re-emphasis on small groups. Um, that is how community is built. That is how we learn to live and love with each other in our communities. Outside of Sunday morning where you come together and worship, we want you to fellowship and be a part of each other's lives. And when we have our fall kickoff on September 11th, even the weeks leading up to that, we're going to have sign-up sheets out there so that you can dig into possibly uh, looking at what that would look like in your schedule to be a part of a group that is there to love and take care of each other. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we get closer to it. But we are in our series, Broken to Heal. This is week four. Uh, and next week, we're going to move into something similar called Lost and Found. This week, though, uh, I really love this story, and I've heard it retold many, many times. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story about me first, if that's all right. We, there's something about us as humans that always relates to the hero of a story. And if it's not you, I certainly do that. I don't want to be the good guy. I want to be the good character. There's something about me that, or us that wants to be the star. In every movie I watch, the sports I watch, I always want to emulate the star. And we see these incredibly gifted people and we think, oh, if I could only be in their shoes. I explained that to my students for the many, many years that I was in youth ministry, that they were in the presence of one of those guys. I was one of those guys. I was a star of the Lincoln Christian University baseball team. Superstar, if you really think about it. I think I hit something like 230, um, hit one home run, blew out my shoulder pitching in the cold weather, got so bad at the end of my career that I ended up being called a player coach. Uh, not just everyone has that resume, church, all right? I was a pretty big deal. Yeah, there we go. Well, then I spent my summers working at camps while I was in college, and I, and I was at a camp in southern Illinois one, one summer where we were playing this game, and it's hard to describe, but it was with a greased watermelon, a great big greased watermelon. Now, just like any game that I got involved in in that age of my life, I wanted to be the star. I wanted to become the center of attention. I would, you know, I'd had moments of greatness in my life, whether it was hitting a half-court shot at the buzzer in an intramural basketball championship game in college. Even the other team was cheering. It was amazing. Or my last at-bat of my college career, or one of the last at-bats of my college career, Playing in Bush Stadium in St. Louis, I had a bases loaded double. I had a really cool few moments in my life. So I find myself this week at church camp just floating around the edges of this watermelon game. It was a, it's a combination of football and water polo is really what it looked like. You got this greased watermelon and you had to get it across the water to the other team's goal line on the other side. And this was this little inlet of water from a big lake and it had a beach on either side of it. And the beach were your goal lines. Uh, uh. And I was just watching, see, because I was working on my humility that week, right? I was just watching the game, not, not too worried about things. Uh, I was not going to get involved. I knew that at 260 pounds, I could dominate this game. And that is not what God wanted for me. Well, there's this other guy, though. All right, let me tell you about him. He was not practicing humility at all. All right? He was about 6'5". He was a big guy. And he went into this game like his hair was on fire. He was going crazy. He was diving into these smaller students, tackling girls less than half his size, <laughs> dunking these young teen and preteen girls, just bullying them left and right. I was playing sort of this goalie position, just standing and watching it, and my job was just to block them from getting up onto the beach. And I was, as I was watching this, those of you who were here last week for us, or, uh, I was feeling like David did when Nathan was telling the story about the rich neighbor who stole the poor neighbor's perfect lamb, right? I was getting angrier and angrier. This guy was evil, all right? He was wrong. He was making my team look bad, too. He had to be stopped, and my anger was rising. It was time, church. It was time for the star, for the hero to show up. And Clint, well, Clint was ready to snap. The guy approached my goal with two girls blocking his way, and he elbowed one and dunked the other, and I could take it no more. 
He lifted that watermelon high above his head in anticipated triumph as he approached the beach in about waist high water. And that was when life as he knew it came to an end. I got low, church. I got low and I sprinted right at him. The water, no hindrance, right? I didn't slow down as I approached him. The sea parted (laughs) as if the force of my indignant rage propelled me at my foe with ever-increasing speed and force. And just as he made his triumphant holler, I speared him in the midsection at full speed. Now, if you've ever seen a cartoon where... um, Someone completely folds up by the force that they were hit by, you know, like that, where their arms and their feet shoot out like that. Um, It was something like that. Uh, This incredible force propelled them backwards. That's what you would have witnessed if you were watching the game that day. I crushed that dude, all right? And then I grabbed the watermelon. I stomped to the other side of the beach and slammed the melon down in triumph as I felt completely justified and satisfied that what I had done was not only justified, but it was necessary, right? He was putting people at risk. I was a hero. Yeah. Walked off that sandy beach feeling like a hero. Now, the end of the story is not quite as pretty as that. Um, Not quite so amazing. I didn't feel like a hero for too long. Because later in that evening, that poor minister, um, (laughs) who was just playing a game a little bit too hard, came back to the camp after a trip to the hospital. Um, He came back with a bad limp, a black eye, and two broken ribs. Now, my moment of triumph then seemed like maybe I'd overdone it a little bit. I wasn't a hero. I was a zero, just like the guy had been during the game before I'd hit him. And I think maybe he realized that too, and that was the reason that he never really got angry at me about what happened. We were just flawed people that let ourselves go too far. But in emotional times, church, I find myself wanting to be the hero. Do you ever do that? Well, this morning we're going to go over a story. Uh, It's one of my favorite stories. It's the story of the woman at the well. And before we even get started, I just want you to know that I have imagined myself many, many times in the story in Jesus' shoes in this story. Haven't you? I mean, I can easily find myself being the hero of the story. I'm going to find that person who is at the well, and I'm going to save them. Right? How we read a story in Scripture, the whose person's shoes we put ourselves in, right? It makes a big difference in how we understand it. And I hope today we can look at this story through a different lens, maybe. I hope you will, than I have before. Because the truth is, even those of us who have heard this story a hundred times or more, we're a lot closer to being the woman at the well than we are to being Jesus. Am I right? I understand that I'm trying to follow him, right? I want to be more like Jesus, but we have to understand the power imbalance that exists here between Jesus and me. That even though we want to live like Jesus, we aren't him. We aren't even close. And we're far closer to being like that woman at the well than we are to being like the Savior. So we're going to look at this story through the perspective of the woman, not through Jesus, instead of his eyes. So before we walk through the day that this woman had, I'm going to give you a little background information about where we are in the world here. What makes up your identity? What defines you as a person? We're going to see that there were a lot of fractured, broken pieces of this woman's identity. One huge part of our identity is our ethnicity, our culture. And we see that, you can see on the map there, where things are lined up there, that Jesus had to walk through a certain area, okay? He had to walk through Samaria. So the woman that Jesus talks to at the well is a Samaritan woman. We know that. And we learn that there is tension between God's people and the Samaritans. And if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 17, it really talks about it. Now, the Samaritans were a part of God's chosen people in Israel until their region was overthrown by the Assyrians, And when they were overthrown, the Assyrians asserted a lot of their culture onto the people of Samaria. And instead of standing firm, the Samaritans gave in in a lot of ways. They worshipped other gods. They they married people from other cultures. They 
mixed the world with God's people and lost the sight of if they still were indeed part of God's people or not. And so because of that, Samaritan people were rejected by God's people. So it was not culturally part of their, and it wasn't just that their identity was fractured, but they also had a fractured religion because of this. Many of them believed in and wanted God, but they weren't a part of the chosen people anymore. They even made their own temple that had been destroyed 140, 150 years before this incident with Jesus, before this meeting at the well. And it was partially done by the hands of God's people. So this tension that lives here between God's people and the Samaritans, it's at an all-time high. And another piece of our identity, church, it's, well, it's our body. It's our gender. And being a woman was much different at this time. Men didn't speak to women in public, especially if they were alone. Women were there to care for children and have children. Don't throw fruit at me. I didn't make up the rules. Okay, that's just how it was back then. Rimen, so what we really have to understand here is the culture we're reading about uh, it was different. And you have to figure that into how you're listening to this interaction. So as we look through this woman's eyes, as, we, as she approaches the well that she walks to every day, and she sees a Jewish man sitting there, there's already, as she's walking up, there's already tension, especially when he speaks to her. Because Jews don't talk to Samaritans and men don't talk to women. But imagine, tension isn't the only feeling here. Imagine that there had to be shame and brokenness and helplessness and feeling like because of your identity, because of where you were born and the body that you were born in, that you weren't even worthy of being spoken to. So now we have some background information on this poor woman. Let's start the story. And as we go through the story, we're going to see the broken pieces of her identity. They don't stop with her ethnicity and her gender and her religious identity either. The Samaritan woman, she leaves her house to go draw water at the sixth hour. That's around noon, guys. This would be a daily ritual, a a normalcy in their culture for the women to go and draw water from the well. But there's a reason that the detail that she went at noon was added to this text. Because in their whole culture, that was really abnormal. Because most people would go in the morning or late in the evening. The task of going to get water always just fell on the women in the house. So in their culture, the the gal pals would gather up in the morning or in the evening uh, when it's not quite so hot, and they would go and get water. And they would spend that time together, a chance to get away from the house, just just the gal pals getting a little drink, you know? And this would have been the first century version of water cooler talk, if you're familiar with that at all. Or when, when, when you're at the carpool place or when moms show up early to pick up their kids so that they can gather around and talk with other moms and socialize, gossip, whatever it is they're doing there. See the moms that gather there with their soccer stuff. But this woman, she went in the middle of the day by herself. So it's safe to assume that this woman was an outcast among outcasts. And even her relationship with the other women in this community was broken. We've learned so much about her, and we aren't even to her conversation with Jesus yet. So, she starts by being asked to give a random man a drink. Now, as a rather large guy myself, I normally don't think twice about random men talking to me when I'm alone, and I'd probably say, sure, come and have a drink. But I have a five foot three inch wife. And I can see how seeing a man out on your own could put you on edge and make you a bit guarded. So she asked him, Why are you, a Jewish man, talking to me, a Samaritan woman? And then the man brings up religion. <sighs> We're going to start there. And he starts saying some pretty confusing stuff about drinking living water. And he says that she should be asking him for water. So she's annoyed, confused. Three of her big identity pieces have already been stepped on, right? Because of the Jewish one, her culture, the man thing, the gender, and bringing up God, religion, already shot. I'd probably snap on him too if I were her. And she basically says, who do you think you are? You aren't greater than Jacob, the guy that made this well. 
You don't even have a way to draw water. In short, who do you think you are and why are you even here? This is our well. (laughs) And the man that she's talking to goes further in depth about this living water. And to be honest, you know, I I went to Bible college for four years and and I still don't quite get it. So I'd imagine that on the spot, she would be completely, well, completely lost hearing him talk about this. Somehow we went from me getting you water to you giving me water that will make me not want to need water anymore. So she's increasingly annoyed and and confused at this point. And, And this is how she replies. Now you can read the verse. It's, we're going to put them up on the screen, however. But I want you to picture this scene because I picture it in my head. I know how I picture it. But basically saying, sure, man, give me your super water. <laughs> Whatever you got. So I don't have to walk all this way to the well by myself every day. If that's what you're offering, give it to me. Just put him in his place. Then her five husbands come into the story. Now, The part of the story that most of you will recognize happens. The most unexpected part of this unexpected conversation and probably one of the most misunderstood parts of this conversation as well. You see, the fractured pieces of her identity were all being brought out in this open conversation. But there was one more piece of her broken identity that hadn't been discussed yet. And it was probably the most hurtful one. Now, it wasn't odd that a man would bring up going to get her husband. Uh, Because that's what they're supposed to do when they're talking to a man uh, without her husband there anyway. But when the man brought up that he knew she didn't have a husband, that she had five. And I think, I think maybe we see this wrong. You see, because for years, my whole life, I see Jesus right here pointing out her great sin and how disgusting that is and maybe that she is. And Maybe I'm reading this thanking God that I'm just not as bad as she is. And we have to understand the culture that we're reading about here. Is there probably something sinful going on with the man that she's now with that she isn't even married to? Probably. There's probably a good chance of that. But the five husbands, divorce truly was a big part of their culture at the time, to be honest. And it mostly, almost never, was the choice of the wife, was it? Being divorced was less often about immorality and more often because the husband rejected the wife and moved on to someone new. It wasn't the most sinful and grotesque part of this woman being pointed out. It was the most broken piece of her identity being brought into the light. See, Jesus didn't bring up this point to point out sin. He brought it up because it's the thing she wanted absolutely nobody to know about. She was rejected because of her culture. She was rejected because she was a woman. She was rejected by her own religion. But even worse, over and over and over again, she had been rejected by the person she loved and trusted the most and was kicked to the curb. Jesus wasn't pointing out sin. This was a woman with a broken identity seeing that this not-so-random man knew all of the most broken parts of her identity and still wanted to offer her a drink. There's a quote that I read the other day that said, relationships form when you're deeply known and still cared for. Relationships form when people know the deepest, dirtiest, nastiest, most broken pieces of your identity and they love you more. And for some reason, we read this and we hear this and we say, we need to be like Jesus and point out people's sins to them so that we can save them. We've got to be like Jesus and point the finger at their brokenness and say, let me fix it for you. Let me be the hero of the story. Well, my hope for you today is that, well, not just today, for every day for the rest of your life, is that you read these passages of scriptures where Jesus brings people from broken to healed And realize that we're a lot closer to being the woman at the well than we are to being Jesus. That we will learn to see the perfection of Jesus and be in complete awe of him. And see the broken pieces of this woman and realize even in our own brokenness, we're fully known and still fully loved. It's at this point that the woman in the well realizes that she has to at least be talking to a prophet. 
this guy knows about her past, and many people think what happens next is her deflecting from the subject at hand, but I'm not sure that that's exactly what's going on here. You see, this man that she had never met before just brought all of her dirty laundry out into the forefront, and she's completely vulnerable and exposed at this moment. And she asked the question burning at the heart of every Samaritan person to this Jewish man of God. So if you Jewish people destroyed our temple, our place of worshiping God, that was, that was right here on this very mountain where we're meeting at, and you don't want any of our people to come to you and worship, what are we supposed to do? And the response from Jesus was exactly what we need to hear as a church today. God doesn't want worship on a mountain or in Jerusalem. He wants worship in spirit and in truth. He wants our souls to long for him. And he doesn't care about the location. He he wants our spirit, our heart to be connected to his spirit and his heart. And here's the secret. Don't throw anything. Again, I want you to say, (laughs) there's nothing special about this building. When this stage or those chairs you're sitting in, and these microphones or the lights, all of it's cool. There's no holy water laced into the doors as you walk through them this morning. There's nothing on the handles. Nothing special happens at 9.30 that, you know, we'll get extra blasts of God goodness out here. What's special is God's Spirit working within us. And we truly gather together in a Spirit-filled truth and worship the one true God together, then we're collectively connected to the Father. I know some of you were feeling that when you were standing with your arms lifted up, right? That's what's special. And that shouldn't only be in this room on Sunday morning. Every time I hear this story, I just feel like sometimes we miss it. I feel like that because I almost want to find something new in it. Because... We just fall into that trap of thinking that we're more like Jesus than the woman of the well. And we say, let's find some broken people and fix them. And then we'll all bring them to the well for water, which, a.k.a., bring them to the church, right? Bring them to church on Sunday. Here's the secret. You can't fix somebody. You can't save them either. You're not that guy. We aren't the hero or the savior in the story. And some people know that they aren't the hero of the story, but they think that the people on the staff here at the church must be as well. We got these special titles, so we certainly are more like Jesus than we are the woman at the well. I want to tell you something. Sitting here doesn't make you special. Jason, does standing here make you feel special? No. Well, maybe in some ways. All right? It doesn't make me set apart. Having a Bible college degree doesn't set me apart. I'm just as human, more human than some of you. And so is every other person on staff, me or Rosie or Brian or Jason or Sheila or the elders, you know, the people here that make the decisions. Whoever it is that you look up to here, we have broken pieces too. We can't save people. So just don't say, I brought them to church. You do your pastor thing. Because I'm more like the woman at the well than I am like Jesus. And the conversation ends by Jesus telling her that he is the Messiah, that he is God on earth. Now, the conversation ends there, but the story doesn't end there, does it? She actually does something about it. The woman leaves her bucket behind and goes directly back to the very people who have rejected her, and she tells them to come and meet Jesus for themselves. She's genuinely excited to tell everyone who has casted her away that they can have whatever this living water junk is too. Whatever it is, you can have it too. Did she know exactly what that meant? Nope. Did she need to? No. Because if this guy really is God here on earth, she didn't need to answer to every question to tell them about it, right? She didn't need to fix everything. Some of you get stuck there, don't you? Some of your kids get stuck there. She didn't have to go back and break up with her boyfriend first, did she? She didn't have to go back and forgive every one of her ex-husbands. She didn't have to fix all of her broken pieces first. Right? Because the great physician does that. She just told these people about Jesus. She went 
to her community with an urgency to share Jesus that any one of us can have. She left in utter disbelief and awe and excitement that she was worthy of a conversation with the Messiah. And even in the midst of her brokenness, the Savior of the world met her right there. Her passion and her urgency to share Jesus with those who rejected her came from an understanding that she wasn't worthy of knowing the Savior of the world, but got to know him anyway. And because of her going and sharing her faith, this flood of Samaritan people came rushing to meet Jesus. If you want to have passion and urgency to to share Jesus, to see a whole community around us redeemed, it doesn't come from having more biblical knowledge or figuring out more ways to serve more. It doesn't come from being a better moral person or being a holier person than the other people that need saved. The passion to go and share Jesus with others comes from what we learn by looking at the story from the perspective of the woman at the well. Jesus redeems broken people. We don't. So let's bring them to Jesus. You don't earn a right to bring people to Jesus. It's your responsibility to bring them to Jesus. And that passion to go and share him comes from realizing that each and every day we're a lot more like the woman at the well than we are like Jesus. From realizing how amazing he is, how perfect he is, how holy he is, and yet he chooses to know me. That patient that passion to go and point a whole village to Jesus comes from realizing that only Jesus can save people and he can redeem their individual broken stories. And I'm so lucky that he's been redeeming mine since I was eight years old. And if I learned anything since I met Jesus in 1980, it's that I can't save or fix people. All I can do is point them towards Jesus. I'm never going to be him. <laughs> Neither are you. I know that. I will never, ever be the hero of the story. But I sure hope that people start to see me a lot like the woman at the well. And every day, I'll tell them, come and see the man who knows everything about me. Every broken piece of my identity. And still offers me a drink of living water. Will you pray with me? God, we're so thankful. So thankful for Jesus' humility, his ability to share, his heart to come and die for all of us, and your desire, above all, your number one desire to know every single one of us, every single bit of our brokenness. God, we just thank you so much for his example. We thank you for this woman and her story, and then we can use it to apply it to our lives. Father, we just praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I can look every single one of you in the eyes and know that you have broken pieces. Now, some of you are really good at hiding them. Some of you are really good at putting on an interesting face on Sunday morning. And that's fine, because in a lot of places, God has redeemed you. God has fixed you and healed you. <sighs> but not all of us. And all of us are, many of us are still working in places where we've just crumbled apart. And we want to be something. We want to help the world around us. We want to be better. We want to make the world around us a better place. We want to celebrate in this place and be a part of a strong family of believers. But all of that comes from giving up our identity as something more than we are and and realizing we are broken and that the love of Christ is what brings us back together and heals us and makes us into something that's worthy of going out and sharing. You're not worthless. God makes you worthy through the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. So I don't know where you land this week. If there are pieces of you we need to pray over. If there are things in your heart that are just so broken that you haven't figured out how to deal with them. I don't know. But I give you this opportunity. We give you this opportunity this morning during invitation time. If you need healing in those areas, we want to pray with you. If you want to say, you know what? The Lord is right. He is in charge. And I have never surrendered that part of my life to Him. I want to give you that opportunity as well. Come up here and share that with us. And we want to pray over you and start you on a path towards knowing him. You want to make Jesus your savior. We would be happy to and joyful to 
to work and walk with you through that. If you want to make this your church home, this would be a time to come before this body of believers and declare, this is where we want to sink our roots. This is, who, this is where we want to share and be a part of the community. And then we invite you to do that. Whatever God is placing on your heart this morning, if you're in a struggle or if you need a declaration to be made, this is that time. Would you stand and join us as we sing our invitation song?
Good morning. I just want to share a few announcements with you. You can sit if you want, or you can just stand there. Whatever's good for you, because I'm standing. I mean, either way. <laughs> um, this is something we're trying this Friday night that we haven't done in a while or ever. I don't know exactly how to do this. This Friday, we're having a movie event here. And uh, Friday at 6 p.m., then we're going to have a re-showing again on Saturday afternoon if you're not able to attend Friday night. Um, we're going to be hosting a movie that there's a Christian group called the Skit Guys, who, uh, if you've seen, they're very funny, but very deep and poignant as well. They made a movie called Family Camp. And so we're doing this movie event, and we want to set it up kind of like Family Camp. We're going to do some things. We're going to take out a row of seat, a few rows of seats. Bring your camping chair in. Bring a sleeping bag or, you know, a blanket. Lay it down on the floor here. We're going to treat it like we're going to the campground, okay? However that you do that, we're going to take some, we're going to have some popcorn and, and some drinks and stuff, and we're going to show it here on the screen. Now, there's something we want you to know. For licensing this, the, they're requesting that we pay $10 per adult, and kids are free. Well, I want you to invite people from your community as well, and maybe we as a congregation can help support that by maybe paying for our neighbors or something like that. This isn't something we do. This is something they're requiring from us. The adults that come in, they're charging us for each time. So think about that. Invite your neighbors. Invite your friends. This is going to be a very family-friendly event with, you know, like I said, popcorn and soda and some things like that. And it's going to be a good message as well. Let's get some people in here that maybe have never been in this building before uh, on Friday at 6 or Saturday at 2. Next Sunday at noon is also our all-church picnic. We're going to be meeting behind the community building. Uh, there will be food, games, and swimming. Um, our school supply giveaway... Barb's right here, is coming up on August 22nd and 23rd. If you would like to donate items, there's a list of things we still need at the Welcome Center. Um, Wednesday, August 24th, there's a, an event at Crane Lake, and that's for all of our students and their families. So all of our kids, you know, K through 12th grade, that have come and been part of our program, that are part of our church, them and their families, we're inviting you out to come out and share a time of fellowship at 5 o'clock on August the 24th. We're going to have hot dogs and stuff. Maybe if you bring a side to share with everybody, that would be great. Bring your swimsuits, towels. We're going to have some lake stuff happening. So it would be a blessing to see you all there. Thank you. Not, I hope not. <laughs> For those of you online, you have to hear it too. So I'll just let you know, somebody said just maybe no greased watermelons if we, were, if we remember our story from earlier. Uh, but if you do, maybe it'll be fun to see. Uh, okay, well, one last uh, quick announcement that was just uh, told to me. Also, thank, er, thank you to everybody who's been helping out with the school supplies and your donations. It's been fantastic, and uh, let's keep that going. Our community is so blessed by everybody every school year from your, for your contributions to the, this uh, program that we do. Uh, we've been doing for a long time. Just thank you so much. Thank, thank you to Barb, who's, who's been known as the, the, the backpack lady for, for I don't know how long. So <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, let's sing one more song to our Lord. Let's have a great day with our friends and family. And let's all sing together. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. church. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much.